Hi, good afternoon. Um, I am actually really, really delighted and feel also very honored to be uh, introducing uh, Dr. Poking Choi, my good friend uh, here at this inaugural, uh, inaugural Bernard Luke Memorial Lecture in Hong Kong Studies. So my task is to introduce you and I would say I'm going to tell every secret about her. <laughs> No, I won't. That's not what a good friend does. Uh, professor Choi is, an, uh, is a professor emeritus in the Department of Educational Administration and Policy in the China. Well, actually here we will say Professor Emeritus, yeah, yes. Uh, I think sometimes, you know, Chinese, let me stereotype for a little bit. I, I'm allowed to stereotype myself. <laughs> Uh, so that sometimes we're too modest. So, um, so again, you know, don't interrupt me. Uh, <laughs> otherwise, I'm taking more than a few minutes. <laughs> Dr. Choi is a professor emeritus in the Department of Educational Administration and Policy in the Chinese University of Hong Kong, where she has worked for 28 years until actually last summer. She was trained as a sociologist in the University of Hong Kong uh, in her undergrad and then uh, the master's and then Oxford University uh, for her doctoral. Uh, her research interests and publication include uh, areas around gender and education, masculinity studies, education policy, history of women's uh, women's movement, as well as life histories of factory workers. And actually, Professor Choi was one of the leading figures in the first wave women's movement in Hong Kong. And I, rem I remember myself as a, a student looking up to her in admiration. <laughs> so, so she has been the director of the Gender Studies um, program in uh, CEO Ch uh, Chinese University of Hong Kong for a number of years. And in the Faculty of Education, uh, her home uh, faculty, she has taught courses on sociology of education, gender and education, education policy, research methods, sexuality education, and more recently, life and death. And after her retirement, which is where she is at now, she continues to write on uh, the construction of masculinity, masculinities among teenage boys in Hong Kong uh, and other research projects. So. Um, uh, Philip already mentioned, uh, actually, Professor Choi is a longtime uh, colleague and good friend of uh, Professor Bernard Luke uh, since their time working together in uh, CUHK. And um, before, actually, before Bernard's passing, he was actually w working on this project proofreading, copy, you know, uh, copy editing, you know, this um, major project. Um, and uh, unfortunately, he passed, and then Professor Choi stepped in to complete complete oversee the completion proofreading and uh, you can look it's a huge volume three volumes and uh, I I look up there are altogether 1356 pages I was saying if it's in English it will be double the number of pages and it is the, the title of it is actually is a very poetic uh, title uh, it's it doesn't make sense to you. You need to understand some poetry, and I, I maybe Professor Choi will explain that. Sitting down and watching the cloud rise. A People's History of the Hong Kong Professional Teachers Union, uh, which is published by uh, the City University of Hong Kong, uh, City University Press of Hong Kong, and then this book has actually just been recently nominated for the, uh, the Hong Kong Book Prize. So with this, I see no other scholar who can best speak at this inaugural lecture than Professor Choi. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ranita, for the very, uh, well, slightly inflated <laughs> <laughs> introduction. Um, today, uh, I am speaking, uh, well, what, do I, what should I say? I'm, I'm trying to, uh, speak in honor of, I'm, uh, of my very dear friend, uh, Professor Bernard Luke, uh, who, was, who has been my mentor for many, many years, starting from the time when I was a doctoral student, which was um, almost 40 years ago, or not quite, but almost 40 years ago. Uh, and when I, um, when I 
agreed to, 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 to stand here and speak, uh, I tried to think of a topic. And then uh, I arrived at this topic uh, uh, because of other things, because of accessibility of materials, uh, because I, I was thinking about audience interests and all that. And then after about three weeks of preparation, I wrote up the abstract and I sent it to Philip. And when I pressed the send button, I suddenly realized that I picked a topic which uh, Bernard would be really, really passionate and interested uh, in. And then just um, a few days before I uh, bought the plane to come to Canada, uh, I picked up um, this book which I co-edited in, uh, co in 2002. And inside I found this, uh, I rediscovered uh, this chapter written by Bernard. And then um, lo and behold, there are two paragraphs which he wrote which was exactly on this topic. And so uh, I have this feeling, you know, I told Fatima when I came here that um, throughout the process of preparing, researching for this lecture, uh, I, 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 I could feel his presence uh, there, uh, which means that um, um, he, he, he would lend me his support, you know, no matter uh, whether he is here physically. Okay, so um, do I operate on this? Uh, yes, I think so. Okay, this is my topic, and as just said, that I've done only about three months of research on it. Uh, although um, I feel that there are some interesting observations coming up, which I hope you know other people would follow up, or other people myself you know would follow up. Uh, what is the story of today about? Um, to summarize, it's about um, maybe two or three things. Number one, of course, it touches on the theme of politics and language uh, very clearly. Um, to break it down, I would say that um, it's a contest between standardization or the need, the perceived need to standardize a national language versus um, the need to preserve you know, diversity, uh, pluralism. Uh, and then, of course, not only um, uh, standardization, uh, not only providing a common language for nationals throughout you know, such a big country as China, uh, but more than that, uh, um, the people who are speaking on the, on the part of the state would argue for um, the dominance, or I would say a linguistic, cultural hegemony uh, on the part of this national common language. So there is this uh, sub-theme of domination, um, of uh, national allegiance, uh, of loyalty, patriotism, etc., uh, versus uh, um, equality, linguistic and cultural equality. Okay, so I hope to make this clear as I go on. And then lately, I see this um, Hong Kong ethnic identity. I'm not sure, you know, how I can defend this, but uh, <laughs> um, ethnic meaning that. Um, well, I've talked about Hong Kong identity. Uh, Bernard has talked about ethnic identity long ago in the. 1980s, 1990s, uh, we were talking about popular culture in Hong Kong, which was you know, um, exported elsewhere, Southeast China, China mainland, and so on. And then even before that, I've been researching into students' movement in Hong Kong in the 1970s. And my argument was that um, it was a quest for uh, Hong Kong identity. But now it's a different kind of thing. It's, it's a they and us kind of thing. It's, over these past 20 years or so, it has not only strengthened into a much stronger, a stronger Hong Kong identity, but a, uh, I would say, um, uh, uh, hardened into uh, a kind of identity which differentiates, differentiates between you and, you and me, right? them and us. And then the last point is very, uh, I won't dare to go into it, uh, social movements in Hong Kong, but um, as you hear me talk, you, would, you, would be, you probably would be able to pick up some implications for social movement in Hong Kong right now. But I won't go in much into that. Uh, we could pick, pick this up at the uh, Q&A session. OK, so just a brief um, overview of uh, what happens with uh, the teaching of Putonghua, PTH Putonghua, and uh, PMIC uh, Putong, uh, okay, uh, Putonghua medium of instruction in Chinese language. Is that OK? Yeah. OK. Um, OK, uh, what is the situation? Right. Uh, just a year before uh, the, uh, the, the changeover, what do you call it, return of sovereignty, uh, 1996, uh, we had an um, education commission, an advisory body on education policy in Hong Kong, issuing its sixth uh, report, uh, ECR6. Uh, the whole report was on um, language uh, in, in Hong Kong, uh, I mean, language in schools, right? teaching of language in Hong Kong. Um, 
of course, the bulk of the report was not on Putonghua or PMIC. It was on more on English and Chinese. Right? Uh, but then, uh, if you look uh, uh, closely at, the re at this report, there is a mention, a slight mention, uh, of uh, probably in the, in the future, it's very vague, in the future, one should look into the relationship between a teaching of Putonghua and the teaching of Chinese language. That's a whole you know, story uh, that I'm talking about now. So that's a start. And then 1998, since 1998, uh, Putonghua uh, became a core subject, just Putonghua, not teaching of Chinese with Putonghua. Uh, for primary and junior secondary school uh, in Hong Kong. Um, but um, it's not really that uh, such a big deal because uh, in Hong Kong, uh, around that time, um, the, the, the top-down education reforms were coming. So there are lots of other uh, subjects or, or, or you know, extra sessions trying to compete for slots in the timetable. So uh, you talk about core subject, but it's only about you know, one period, one session in the whole week. So it's, it's nothing much. And then for uh, 2001, we're talking about benchmarking uh, you know, English teachers and, uh, and, and Putonghua teachers. But again, the whole attention was on, was on English teachers. There were, there were movements, uh, there were protests you know, staged by the PTU, the Prote Professional Teachers Union, and so on. And then come um, 2000, 2000, 2003, uh, there were some documents, official documents, saying that, uh, OK, um, we can make uh, PMIC, you know, teaching of Chinese language uh, with Putonghua, a optional thing, a school-based decision. So it's not uh, compulsory, it's not man mandatory. You know, each school could decide for themselves. Why? Because um, the argument was that, um, the observation actually was that, uh, we can start, uh, We can still yet not prove the uh, uh, the efficacy of teaching Chinese language in Putonghua. So let's uh, leave it for the moment, and then uh, uh, let's do more research. Okay, but then um, th there's a sharp. There was a sharp increase in the number of schools uh, uh, using uh, Putonghua as a medium of instruction for Chinese uh, from 2008 onwards. That's because um, the government uh, put uh, put put out a plan, a project. A uh, funding project for uh, inviting schools to to apply, uh, basically as primary and secondary schools to apply, uh, and if you are successful, then you get money for three years, quite a bit of money for um, uh, 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 inviting mainland experts, local experts, mostly mainland experts, uh, to help you develop PMIC, and then uh, some money for uh, teachers who have to attend development workshops so to, to get replacement teachers and so on. So um, there was a sharp increase. You can see the, uh, the, 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 the graph here. I'm sorry, I just stole it from. <laughs> I, stole, I stole this graph from um, a, 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 a youth uh, social movement group. Uh, I'll talk about this more. Um, and then they, they make this plotted, this, this graph. And so you can see the sharp increase in 2008. Uh, a lot of schools responded to that invitation, right? Uh, and it's easy to understand because, um, because that was a time of cutbacks. Yes, we all understand that, right? Cutbacks everywhere. And then uh, 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 a sort of a, a, a wave of killing schools in Hong Kong, we call it sat hao, killing schools off, which, is, which means closing schools, uh, which are said to be uh, you know, underperforming, that sort of thing. So why not? You know, there's extra money for you to apply for, so you go for the money, uh, and then you can put on your web website advertisement saying that my school uh, you know, has PMIC, my school teaches Chinese in Putonghua. And then that appeals very strongly to, uh, or that has a very strong appeal to parents who think, yes, I mean, I don't have to pay for extra Putonghua classes and my kid could go to school and learn Putonghua, lovely. And then, of course, uh, most of the parents are very, uh, they're thinking of, you know, uh, business opportunities, uh, working opportunities in future, and so on and so forth. The, in other words, the instrumental kind of uh, reason for it. Uh, you don't want this. I mean, it's just 70, around 70% uh, of primary and 36.9% in the last year uh, uh, adopting PMIC. But mind you, it's not really that scary. Scary? No, I mean, lovely. I don't know. Uh, um, uh, it's just a figure saying that our school, uh, you know, if you are within the 70%, you, you, you do have PMIC classes. But the normal practice is a very, very funny kind of arrangement. Okay, uh, you're talking about primary school, let's say. Uh, let's say we have four classes in the whole grade, primary one. Uh, usually only two classes, or one, or 
three at most out of four would uh, practice PMIC, okay? Because you don't, you don't dare to experiment with all the kids. And then usually they pick the best classes to you know, do this. And then the funny thing is when you go to primary six uh, or primary five or for secondary school, if you go to uh, primary, uh, sorry, uh, secondary four, because you have to pre prepare for the uh, public exams at the end of, this, of your school, uh, school years. And then for primary school, you have to prepare for the territorial, uh, uh, what do you call it, TCA, uh, competency sort of test, all right? territory-wide kind of test. So you, you don't want to risk your, 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 your students, okay? Because all these tests will be taken in Cantonese. I mean, you can opt to take in Putonghua, but then if you take that, if you let your kids take those tests in Putonghua, it's even a bigger risk because you don't know there might be mainland children whose native language is Putonghua, then you will lose out. And we Hong Kongers don't want to, we don't like losing out, you see? So the thing is, primary one, primary two, you go to PMIC if you're in elite classes. Primary three, you'll go back to Cantonese. Or primary five, you'll go back to Cantonese. Secondary one, two, three, you go to Putonghua if you're in the elite class, and then you go to, back to Cantonese. Just to be sure that you win, all right, in the aim. All right, so that's a bit scary. Uh, <laughs> Okay, why? Uh, let me summarize a little bit on uh, the arguments for PMIC. The arguments for PMIC. Um, okay, uh, and then I briefly mentioned where do I get those arguments? Okay, I, I read up um, essays by mainland scholars uh, uh, who wrote about how to promote Putonghua uh, in Hong Kong after the changeover return, right? Uh, and then I also. Um, uh, 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 read some uh, legislative, uh, legislative council, uh, sort of parliament uh, uh, debates, uh, and, and look for the arguments and so on. Okay, so uh, what are the arguments? Number one, of course, is national integration. National integration. We are now uh, a big family, big Chinese family, and then of course uh, we need to know what our nationals are talking about. Okay, <laughs> so naturally. But again, as I said earlier, it's not only about communication. It's about um, hegemony. That if you are if you are a Putonghua, a fluent Putonghua speaker, then you are more civilized. They did use that, not in Hong Kong, but in the uh, 200, 2010, there were, there were protests in Guangzhou, in, in, in uh, Guangzhou, in, in Canton, Canton, Guangzhou, um, against the uh, uh, government imposition of Putonghua uh, in uh, the um, TV stations, right? So um, then the, the, slo the government slogan was Gong Man Zhou Man Ming Yan, Gong Putonghua. Be a civilized person, speak uh, Putonghua. Okay. So uh, national self-respect, uh, allegiance. And then all these quotes are from the, um, uh, the pro-government legislators uh, in, the, in, a, in a debate uh, in 2002. That was quite early, 2002. Uh, national self-respect, uh, to remedy the malaise of losing our roots. I mean, we, we have been a British colony, so we've all lost our roots. And then, uh, uh, well, of course, we're not going to agree to that, I know. Uh, the Chinese roots are roots of a great nation. We should integrate into this family, blah, blah, and so on. Sorry, and so on. <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, the, the earlier quote I, I mentioned, a higher cultural accomplishment, um, uh, that, 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 that uh, you, you, you become, uh, you, you, you are integrated into the family, and Putonghua somehow, the northern dialect is, more um, advanced uh, in terms of more than Chinese uh, in Dai Huan Yu than Cantonese. Uh, Cantonese always speak things that we don't understand, right? Okay. And then the next argument is a uh, teaching advocacy argument, sort of educational argument, right? Uh, teaching. Uh, uh, writing as I speak argument, uh, I translate into writing as I speak. Okay. Um, the, the modern Chinese language in Dai Huan Yu, the modern Han Chinese language, so to speak. Uh, is based on the um, northern dialect, okay? Northern dialect, spoken dialect. Uh, it's 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 a sort of more a little bit more refined way of uh, of, of presenting, you know, the northern dialect. And since uh, modern Chinese is based on a northern dialect, so if you learn it in a northern dialect, uh, I mean the national language, then you would learn Chinese better. Okay, that is the argument. Uh, later on, I would I would. Um, mention you know how 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 my interviewees uh, yes I did interviews too for this uh, lecture uh, how, how how they uh, rebuke uh, 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 refute this argument okay um, and the last one is uh, the one that I've mentioned already instrumental motivation one word that is uh, very often heard in the electrical debate in 2002 was business opportunity 
Songke, Songke, uh, you know, business opportunity. So now um, Chinese, you know, uh, many of our Hong Kong graduates will have to uh, go to surf companies in, you know, big Chinese companies. And then we have the um, uh, uh, individual traveling, you know, was allowed in uh, to Hong Kong and, and elsewhere. So uh, why not serve our customers and by speaking their language? Okay, so that, that was very convincing. That's why you see the sharp rise in the in the in the number of schools uh, taking Putonghua. Okay, okay. Let me go to the uh, story itself. Uh, voices of dissent. Um, and how do I do this? How do I get the voices? Okay, again, I look up um, uh, debates, uh, logical debates, and elsewhere. But then, uh, the major body of material comes from four interviews. Yes, only four. Sorry, I, I need more time to do more. Um, and um, I'll mention about the interviews later on. But then uh, if you look at it chronologically, uh, this dissent, the voices of dissent, didn't appear until early 2010, I would say. Just, just the last you know, six, seven years. It's a very, very uh, 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 new, you know, newly emergent uh, 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 situation that, that you have this um, confrontation, this contest, very hot, you know, heat, heated discussion. So in the early 2000, or even in 2000s, you know, in the mid mid 2000s, uh, there were individuals who write uh, paper. I mean, write essays in newspapers, uh, columns, and so on, uh, and they talk about you know uh, uh, the, the argument uh, falls into two 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 different you know two main sets. Number one is uh, the writing as I speak argument is wrong. Okay, it's a fallacy. Uh, and one of the writer is uh, Siona. Some of us here know her. Uh, she is a teacher, a secondary school teacher, teaching Chinese and Putonghua in uh, secondary school. But she doesn't approve of using Putonghua to teach Chinese. Uh, she wrote a lot. She is a creature. At the same time, she is a very um, uh, a lively uh, uh, teacher, uh, uh, writer, critic. Uh, so, uh, and then uh, the other other few names. Uh, one of them is Chan Wan, uh, who since the mid two uh, thousands. Uh, wrote a lot about uh, how Cantonese is linked up with the ancient Chinese culture. Uh, so, in in a, in, a, in in the words of a young scholar in China, uh, in Hong Kong, uh, he he and some other writers uh, represent a voice uh, which um, is sort of a nativist. Uh, you know, we are born Ch uh, Cantonese, so we're Cantonese is closer to the old ancient you know Chinese and so on. So it's a nativist manifestation of. Um, a, uh, I would say, uh, 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 imagined kind of uh, ancient uh, uh, Chinese culture. Okay, but I won't go into that because I'm not an expert in that. But anyway, uh, people like Chan Wan became uh, his writings became a kind of bible for the young activists that I would be telling you about. Okay, uh, and then these two logos, these are um, Facebook groups. And uh, you know, being such a senior person, you know, senior old, I mean, uh, I didn't realize, you know, I didn't realize the, the importance of uh, Facebook as a, as a form of social activism, All right? So this is uh, the uh, oh god, I can't remember the name. Uh, Societies Linguistic Hong Kong Jesus. <laughs> Goodness, yeah. So uh, they, they are fond of these young 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 activists. They are fond of using this. Uh, Sort of Romanized Latin, whatever. Uh, okay, this is this is. Uh, uh, I, I would say say more about that. So these are the Facebook forums, uh, which actually uh, spearheaded the whole um, uh, movement uh, for two more than two years, maybe. Uh, I would call them internet uh, offensives, right? It's just for on on the. It's, I should, shouldn't use the word just, but it's a lot more than that. But uh, basically, it's ba uh, Facebook based and public campaigns and logical. Uh, there were debates, but the logical <coughs> debates, uh, I would say, came. Most of them came after the young people came out, you know, uh, in this movement. So you can you can get a get an idea of this is the Facebook page, the home page, right? So um, how did they start? Um, I interviewed these two young young people, uh, um, uh, uh, LH. LH started the first one, the Societas, whatever, Societas Linguistic Hong Kong Jesus. Um, he, he, he is now about 22 years old. He is now in university studying Chinese medicine. But when he started the, 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 the forum, uh, it was just after his public exams for university entrance. So he's got lots of time on his hands. And that was 2013. That's important. Just after uh, uh, 2012, the anti-national education campaign or movement. I would say more about that, a bit more about that. So he had lots of time on his hands, so he just, uh, you know, 
uh, served. And then he found this discussion in Gong Dang, you know, Hong Kong Golden Forum. All the young people in Hong Kong know. It's a very popular sort of uh, online chat uh, kind of forum. And then uh, he's, he, he, he saw some, um, an accident saying, hey, how? Uh, 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 can you imagine? I, I heard Hong Kong kids, school, school children, speaking Putonghua among themselves on the MTR. I said, what's happening to Hong Kong? You know? And then the, the whole thing you know, uh, snowballed. And then he invited um, people to PM him, PM, you know, private message him on the uh, forum. And, say, uh, and then he started, he and a few friends started this uh, uh, SLH uh, forum. Um, they, uh, they most, uh, he said, uh, most of the, the work they did it on the uh, internet uh, is a sort of keyboard, uh, keyboard battle. But it's not an easy keyboard battle. It's not, he said, they are not um, addressing the fellow netizens. They are addressing parents. That's very important, addressing parents and teachers. So they did, did a lot of research work, dug up essays, reports. That's how they got connected with Siona, the teacher critic. Right? And then Chen Wan, of course, uh, people who spoke in, uh, on, in favor of Cantonese news clips. They search for, they have lots of time, you see, and they've got sharp eyes for you know, a, a website. So they look for um, uh, official app website. Um, Education Bureau website, uh, 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 I mean, the Hong Kong Observatory and, say, Observatory and so on, and see where they say, you know, something that is wrong, what they, they thought was wrong. I'll give you examples. And then they would um, digest these uh, reports and then post um, synopsis and so on on the, uh, on the, on the Facebook. Um, and then they did some hard um, search, data search. Uh, since 2013, they did telephone surveys of all the schools in Hong Kong. All the schools in Hong Kong. That's not a lot, about a few hundreds, uh, six, 600, 500 primary schools and a little bit more uh, of secondary schools. And then they would pretend to be parents calling up the school and say, hey, hello, um, I'm going to send my kid. Uh, how do you teach Chinese and so on? So they did uh, these surveys. And then uh, they post these surveys, uh, results of these surveys online. And then they hold press conferences and so on and so forth. And then if you go on their Facebook, you can, you can see the whole uh, archive there. Right of the survey. And then they did uh, campus campaigns, uh, street campaigns. And then we move on to a uh, students' concern group, the okay. the uh, PMIC uh, students' concern group. Um, I interviewed Woody. I call him Woody. Uh, Woody uh, was about 14 to 15 years old uh, when he started the whole campaign. Uh, in the internet uh, age, it's a different thing, you know, yeah. So uh, uh, he, was, uh, he was 14, about 15, 14. He was in secondary three. And he started this uh, group in uh, 2014. Uh, I'll tell you why. Uh, and then same as uh, the uh, SLH, they did all these things. And then they did a bit more. They did um, street stations, they call it. Every month, they would go to a crowded area, busy part of town. And then they would distribute pamphlets and so on. Uh, okay. Uh, oh, sorry. This is not. Uh, I have to go back. Uh, give me a few minutes. Uh, I want to place uh, this anti um, anti PMIC campaign in the recent history of social movement in Hong Kong, and that's why I have to go back a little bit and mention two in particular. One is the anti national education protest in 2012. Uh, this is not as internationally well known as the later one, the Umbrella Movement, of course. Uh, but I found out from my interviews with the uh, young people that this was to them more, even more important, much more important uh, as a sort of motivation or political mobilization than the umbrella movement. OK, so uh, I, I can't go into details, but um, it was um, the government who issued a, um, a, a consultation document on uh, introducing a new subject into, uh, primary, uh, into primary and secondary school called moral and national education subject. And the document was out in 2011. Uh, we adults were busy doing things, holding meetings, teaching, and so on. We didn't take much attention. The boys, the boys and girls, the kids, uh, picked us up in that year. And then they, uh, in 2011, they formed a scholarism. Again, a very difficult word. You know, they're fond of that. Uh, Hotman Sijiu. Uh, Joshua Wong was, you know Joshua Wong, he's coming next week, right? Joshua Wong was 15, he was just a baby, right? I mean, he looks so young. Um, he was one of the uh, initiators of scholarism who protested against the anti national 
uh, uh, education, and his colleagues were much older. Right? His colleagues were 14, 15, 16. The oldest would be 16 or maybe 17. I don't know. Uh, so there were a lot of uh, they organized marches, and then after a while, the adults joined in. The parents group of the uh, PTU, the Professional Teachers Union, joining in, uh, and there was a summer of um, 2012. Summer is always a good time for students' movement. <laughs> you understand? <laughs> yeah. OK, so uh, they took over uh, the Civic Square. Uh, that's uh, what the government call uh, a very clumsy name, the Eastern Extension of the Government Headquarters, <laughs> something like that. But the students named it the Civic, Center, uh, Civic Square. They uh, possessed or uh, occupied the Civic Center. And then uh, the kids, I mean, the, the young people started the uh, hunger strike. And then the old people, <laughs> like me, I mean, I didn't, but my friends, they joined the hunger strike. And then it was the end of summer, almost the end of summer holidays. And then the critical moment came, uh, school started. And the kids came with the school bags and the, in the school uniforms after school, did their homework there, and then they went on stage and sp talked and so on. And then the government relented. The government took it back uh, in, uh, on the 8th of September. Not, not wholly, I mean, they have to have faith, you see. So they say uh, they would reconsider that sort of thing, okay. And then, of course, the umbrella movement. Everybody remember that. But these two movements, uh, 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 the emphasis for me today is that they are very, very youthful in character, very, very young. That's why, for even the, for the umbrella uh, uh, movement, I pick out the, uh, 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 the, the where you see young faces, and it's not difficult at all. You know, they're all over the place. And then I want to introduce this. Maybe you know that already. This is also the self-study room because there were kids who have to do their homework, who have to prepare for exams, particularly for those uh, students who have to prepare for the university entrance, public uh, you know, exams. So they need a place to study, even if you go to the occupied areas. So uh, somebody uh, put together furniture and so on, and then you said, quiet, you know, please keep quiet, because they are revising, so on. OK, so I try to place this, um, uh, uh, before I go into that, I'll just give you a quote uh, from uh, LH, the, uh, the, the young man who is who's studying uh, 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 Chinese medicine now, uh, the one who started the SL, the Societas Linguistica, whatever. Uh, he said something really interesting. He said, after 2012, uh, the students considered themselves having, you know, they have won the battle, which, which was true, actually. They have won the battle. And then he said, you know, they felt this potential power in their hands. Uh, they felt that there's something more about, you know, it's not only national education. There must be something more, you know. And so with this uh, Long Bao Dou, <laughs> slay dragon sword in hand, they don't know what to slash with, okay? <laughs> I suppose, you know, they do that. And then, and then uh, uh, Eric said, in the end, they, they landed um, on the uh, universal suffrage. That's what Joshua Wong and his colleagues did. Right, they pick up the issue of uh, universal, uh, universal suffrage, and it's still ongoing. Uh, there was a whole thing about umbrella, right? But then uh, SLH and the, I mean uh, LH and uh, Goody, these other guys, they picked on a different thing. This, he said, I, we picked on the language issue. I know it's a difficult issue to pick on. It's uh, very subtle, and people don't necessarily understand. Right? National education is easy, brainwashing, bad, right? Uh, umbrella movement, it's about uh, you know, not giving us the vote, that's bad. But then language, you, know, you need a lot of thinking. You know. But then uh, these, these, these uh, young people, they said, we think language is the, is the, is the bottom line. You know, we, can't, we can't go beyond, we go back on this bottom, bottom line. Okay. So let me give you a little bit of uh, highlights, I'm looking at the time, of the PMIC movement. Um, as I said, uh, it's not like national language, or it's not, uh, sorry, it's not like national education. You have a one you know, target of attack, and it's not like universal suffrage. It's hidden somewhere. You know? um, so what they did was they just sit in front of the key uh, computers, and then they would search all these government websites. <coughs> Aha, and they found something in February of 2014. Uh, in 2000, well, I won't go into that because I'll show you a, few, a three minutes uh, clip on that. Uh, it's about the education bureau saying something stupid, like uh, Cantonese is not an official language, sort of thing. Okay, and then uh, and then they picked on the education, uh, what do you call it, uh, ETV, education television uh, program. You don't have that, have those here, right? Okay, it, it's like uh, it started in the 70s, I think, 1970s. Um, the, the the government TV, uh, government no, it's a public government uh, public TV station. Uh, 
ran a list of uh, daily uh, education programs in Chinese, English, uh, math mathematics, uh, civic education, whatever. And then there would be you know, people going, out, oh, hi, how are you? How do you say this in English? Oh, this is blah, blah, blah. That's ETV. And then these kids pick something up in the ETV. You will see it later on. And then they, they you know, send protests and so on. And then there's another one, um, um, work, uh, educate with conscience. You have, if you are an educator, you have to have conscience. Uh, don't teach Chinese in Putonghua because of business opportunity. Teach in the best language uh, of communication, which is Cantonese. I won't go into details, but you can see these guys there. These are the, um, uh, these are, they are younger ones over here, uh, secondary school kids, and then you have the older ones, uh, like uh, university uh, students and so on. Okay, let me show you uh, this clip just for a few minutes. Uh, what do I do? Okay. Yes. And then, right. Sorry. All right. There we go. Mm -mm -mm. Okay. This is from uh, Pulse, which is a um, uh, English language, a English channel, kind of public affairs uh, program. No sound. No voice. Oh, I see. No sound is going. Let's check the back. Check the sound box. Sorry. <laughs> Always happens. Could I ask a question? Sure. When you say teaching Chinese, are, are language, you, are you teaching Cantonese in Cantonese, or or is it? I'll go into that. I'll go into that later. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so Cantonese lost. <laughs> I think we can stop here. You get, the, you get the idea, right? So I'll just go down, right? Yeah, okay. So um, it's, it's, you know, it's only these young people who have got so much time you could you know, get all these things. And then they created you know, furor and then you know, to extend that the Education Bureau had to make an apology. Uh, these are some of the photographs that I found on their Facebook and provided, some of them are provided to me by uh, the interviewees. Um, these two, okay, uh, these are the, uh, the younger group, okay, the, 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 the student concern group, the secondary students, and the really serious, serious students, uh, very serious guys. Um, they set up street stations, as I said. Uh, this is a street station in Mong Kok, uh, near the railway station, and they do it every, every month. Of course, they have to stop uh, during exam time because you know, and then um, and then this is the July first March. Uh, you know, uh, the, the Hong Kong was officially returned to China on July the first, 1997. So every year there is the July first celebrations on the one hand, and there's a July March on the other hand, uh, on the other side. And so um, this was very important for the student group because it was the first time they came out as a group, uh, using their own banners. And then more important, they were able to fundraise. They make about ten thousand Hong Kong dollars. No, no, yet ten thousand. 10,000 Hong Kong dollars, which is a fortune to these kids, because in the past they had to you know, get the pocket money and, and then print. Uh, oh, by the way, I have some uh, of the pamphlets, so you could, if you like, you can pass them around and take a look at, those, at these pamphlets that, uh, made by the student group. 
Okay. And then they are very serious. They organize seminars uh, 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 on uh, teaching in Putonghua and in Cantonese. And these are the campus campaigns, you know, uh, different universities protesting against university decisions to uh, make Putonghua a compulsory subject or making um, compulsory subjects, general education subjects being taught in Putonghua. Okay, I won't go into this. Okay, um, let me talk about their arguments. What are their arguments? What's wrong with PMIC? Yeah, okay. Uh, number one is on the level of uh, education, teaching. All right? Language learning, um, the fallacy of writing as I speak. I'll get into this gentleman's point about uh, you know, how do you teach Chinese. Right? Um, the writing as I speak argument. OK, of course, uh, it's not these young you know, these students who make up these arguments. They, they did a lot of research into you know, written essays uh, and so on. And then um, they said this argument is actually taken, uh, the, the slogan of writing as I speak. It seems to have a long history of, let's say, um, almost 100 years now. But, but it was now, if you use it right now, in the sense that if you teach Chinese uh, language or a Chinese subject in Putonghua, then you are closer to Chinese. Uh, this is not what this argument originally meant, and I won't go into that. Uh, but the point is, um, they have, the argument is that if you believe in this argument, then you're missing out a very major characteristic of the Chinese language. The Chinese language is such that um, the, the spoken uh, 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 part of it and the written part of it they are linked up very, uh, the, 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 they are very loosely linked up, put it that way. Uh, there is, uh, in, um, in, a, in a sociologist of uh, uh, you know, language, uh, Joseph, uh, his surname is Joseph, uh, he said um, Chinese language is different in a sense that uh, it has a great latitude of audio visual link. Okay? So, which means that if you take up a Chinese text, this is Chinese text. You can read or teach it in any dialect, northern, southern, Fujianese, Cantonese, uh, Chiu Chao, whatever, uh, Su Chao, and you can still teach it, no problem. Because the, the link, it's not like alphabets, it's not, not like Western languages, which is sound-based. This is not sound-based, this is you know, visual. And then the visual part and the audio part is loosely, very loosely linked together. So for, for centuries, Chinese language has been taught or the, 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 the whole literary genre, uh, you know, the corpus, is taught in different dialects, different regional and local dialects, and there's no problem about that, all right? So if you say you have to learn uh, Putonghua, uh, Chinese language in Putonghua, uh, then you learn writing better, then this is a fallacy. Do I get it? I, I, I think I understand what you're saying. Thank you, thank you, yeah, okay. Then uh, Siona, uh, one of my uh, teachers, uh, she's actually the oldest interviewee. She's in the late 40s, early 50s, late 40s, I would say. Uh, she's a very experienced Chinese teacher. She said, if you use Putonghua to teach Ch uh, Chinese and the kids' uh, native uh, language is Cantonese, then there is a lot of unnecessary distraction. Like, uh, you would spend too much time on Putonghua pronunciation and too much time on colloquial northern dialect. How do you say uh, tomato? Is it fan ke or sai hong qi, you know? Yeah. You know, that sort of thing. So um, we don't need this kind of distraction, particularly when you are young, when you learn this language, when you are young, you don't need to do that. If you want to learn it, then you do it later, as Putonghua, not, you know, teaching uh, in that language. And so there's unnecessary distraction. And then uh, even more serious is that it inhibits deep level thinking. It's just like teaching um, our subjects, uh, you know, teaching Chinese students in English. It's the same thing. Uh, I was in an English uh, school when I was a kid, you know, primary and secondary. What do you do? I mean, you keep quiet. <laughs> if you keep quiet, you don't make mistakes. Okay, if the teachers say, hey, Vivian, speak up, you know, uh, what do you think about this? Now, what do you do? According to Tang, Deng uh, Xingfeng, who is now teaching in Education University, he wrote this um, uh, article in 2008. Uh, he did some observation, classroom observation. And then he observed that in these Putonghua PMIC classrooms, um, the students would use this strategy of avoidance. Don't look at the teacher's eyes, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and then if the teacher called you out, what do you do? You imitate what the teachers have just said. Use what the, teacher, the phrases, 
you know, that they have, he or she has just used, then you are safe. You don't make mistakes. So this is uh, avoidance or imitation in writing, not only in speaking, but also in writing. Uh, sentences are thin in content, and cultivation of cognitive skills are impeded. That's what this scholar uh, found out. Uh, more research is now being done, so we are awaiting uh, some other um, research results. And then Siona, our teacher interviewee, said uh, very clearly it inhibits classroom interaction. Right? It's very difficult for students to speak up using a foreign language. And then, um, just then, uh, the arguments are all about, um, all I say is a more surface a a level of, of, of teaching and learning. Now, um, I'd like to go deeper, because my interviewees go, went deeper in our interviews. Um, basically, they say, Putonghua um, is a modern Chinese language. It's less than a century old. But Chinese language and Chinese culture is much more than that, and much longer than that. So if you teach Chinese literature or Chinese convey cu Chinese culture uh, using Putonghua, and then Putonghua is not the kid's native language, then you lose out a lot in your um, transmittance, transmission, in the transmission of, of, of the language. So let me uh, give you a quote from our youngest interviewee. He is, uh, I interviewed him uh, maybe in February, I think, early February, and he was 17 uh, then. Maybe he's not 18, I don't know. He said, uh, okay, let me tell you a bit about this boy. Um, he, he, he lives, um, uh, he, his father uh, has a lot of books at home. So he grows up reading Chinese texts. And right now his bedtime reading is Dao De Jing, Dou Da Geng. <laughs> I haven't read that myself in original. Uh, uh, and it's because he said, uh, you know, I don't un understand 100% of Dou Da Geng, of, uh, you know, Lao Zi, Zhuang Zi, Rou Zi, Zhuang Zi. I don't understand, uh, uh, you know, the whole, but I don't want to read uh, annotated text because I don't want to go through other people's interpretation of the original text. I want to, sam gao, how do you call it? I want to, oh yeah, okay. I want to meet these old sages in spirit. You see what he means? Okay. So well, that's this uh, very serious, very serious uh, reading boy, right? And he said, um, I've, I've started reading when I was very, very young. Uh, and I'm very sensitive to, to, to mainlandized language. Of course, I have to tell you, he read a lot of Chen Wan, you know, the person who attacked communist uh, Chinese, right? As being vulgar, as being, you know, uh, 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 doing bad, just doing injustice to, to Chinese language and so on. Okay, so we start to read at a very young age. So if you show me mainland dice writing, dialogue, you know, mainland style writing, I will feel so disgusted, uh, disgusted. They are so clumsily written. And I have to say, I, I agree with him. Because when I was preparing for this lecture, I came across this um, essay written by a mainland scholar in 19, it was published in 1994. And the title of the essay was, uh, How do you teach, promote Putonghua in, uh, in Hong Kong after the uh, return of sovereignty, right? And so he made a lot of clever, I mean, brilliant suggestions. And then he said, now, let me look at the texts that, 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 that are used in Hong Kong, okay, for Chinese language, the Chinese subject. They use too many old chan gao, dusty, dusty texts. Now, how dusty are they? These are from the early years of the 20th century. Is that dusty? No way. I mean, you're talking about Chinese. It's, it's not dusty at all. Sorry, it's my personal opinion, OK? You can forget about that. But then he made two examples. I'm telling you one. He said, uh, I, flipped, uh, I went through these um, Chinese um, textbooks used in Hong Kong, and I discovered that too many of these uh, dusty texts are used, like the May 4th uh, literature, the, the early 20th century literature. And then uh, there's this uh, famous uh, writer, uh, Bing Sam, right? Bing Xin, if you uh, learn, uh, know Mandarin. And then there's this uh, photo in the textbook uh, of a young, very young Bing Sam, this young uh, woman scholar, uh, writer. Uh, and the subtitle was Fu Kup Mei Gok Dik Bing Sam, Fu Kup Mei Gok. What is that? It means um, cup is, this word is, uh, um, it's like a, it's a, it's a box a box that you carry on your back if you have to travel from somewhere to somewhere, like from Guangdong to 
Beijing, uh, wherever to do the civic service exam. Anyway, to leave your home for study, then you carry this big box on your back. So it now it's a metaphorical, I find quite elegant language of meaning, you know, referring to overseas study. You're going, leaving home, leaving home far away to go to a faraway place, so Fukup may go. And this Mr. Chen said, uh, now why, why, why do you say Fukup may go? We should say Lao Hok may go. We should say Bing Sam who uh, did overseas studies in the States, instead of using this metaphorical language. And I was jumping up from my seat when I read it. Me <laughs> ah, <laughs> you know, gao ye. Okay, um, so I mean, the, 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 if you look at um, the late, uh, we had um, a Chinese uh, Nobel laureate in literature, Mao Yin, all right, a few years back. Mao Yin, he got the, uh, he was a Nobel laureate in literature. I haven't read his, uh, his, his works, I have to com confess. But I know that a lot of his texts were written in local, colloquial, uh, you know, his dialect, his local dialect. So, and then he got the Nobel Prize. Mm -hmm. so, so we don't need to go for a standardized, kui fan, that's the, the word they use, kui fan, national language. Okay, so uh, let me go through some of the quotes. Uh, 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 LH, that is the uh, Chinese medicine student, he said, um, he was very proud when he said that. My professors, uh, we have a subject called uh, Chinese med medical classics. We have studied those. And then my professors who are northerners would make us stand up and read those texts in Cantonese. Because my professors said many of those uh, intonations are already lost in a northern dialect. So please read that out in class in Cantonese so that we could enjoy you know, the, the, the old and the ancient intonations. Okay. And so of course, obviously, you can imagine how happy he was. And then Alex, okay, uh, that is another of my interviewees. Uh, who is he? He is 35 years old. Uh, he is a precocious Chinese scholar. I knew him when he was 14, 15. Uh, he was reading a Song Dynasty text on uh, from Chinese phonetics. You know, these guys are a little bit you know, off. Uh, and that's how I knew him, because he read this uh, Song Dynasty text, which was edited by my colleague in Chinese University of Hong Kong. So he didn't understand something in this Song text, and he asked his own secondary school teacher. The teacher said, I'm sorry, I don't know either. Why don't you write the writer? So he wrote a letter to my colleague, and the letter, and, the, and my colleague was expecting a middle-aged man. But then there came a young boy in a school uniform, 15 years old. So now he's, he got first class honors in Chinese uh, language uh, later on, and then he did um, a master's and then a PhD. And right now he is a Chinese, uh, in Chinese university as a lecturer teaching Chinese language. And so you could imagine the passion and the, the deep you know, passion that he has for Chinese language. And so he was one of my interviewees. He said, uh, for me, classical and modern written Chinese is just on a continuum. It's not too shonyu, you see? It's a continuum. And in the two paragraphs uh, written by Bernard uh, that, I, that I rediscovered a few, uh, just a week ago, uh, he actually said um, uh, Cantonese is, near, uh, is closer to classical Chinese than uh, the modern, uh, okay, the Han, uh, the, the modern Putonghua. So classical and modern written Chinese should be seen as different points on the same continuum. And we should see the, uh, the similar for regional or local vocabulary. I would see them as variation in style. And so there is uh, no need to go for standardization. And therefore, the uh, teaching as I write of, uh, uh, argument is, doesn't stand. And then Siona, my teacher uh, interviewing, said, if you look deeply into the Chinese language, and then he, she, she go, went on to talk about the early ancient Chinese classics. He said, it's just not that, she said. Chinese language is not that alone. It's that, but it's not that alone. Uh, you're talking about Qin and Han dynasties 2,000 years ago. You're talking about Tang and Song poetry more than 1,200 years ago. You're talking this whole rich legacy, heritage, right? So they're just, you can't reduce that to modern Chinese. And we are teaching kids, you know, just conveying this Chinese language to our kids. So we cannot be confined by uh, uh, Putonghua. Okay. So do I get myself clear on those two points? Number one is the, the language teaching thing, which is on a service level. And then the deeper thing is the, the love and the, how, how you see um, the language and, and the teaching of the language. OK. Uh, another point is, uh, uh, I, just, I just mentioned it briefly, that um, after 1997, particularly uh, 2010, 2012, um, the mainland Hong Kong 
relationship on the lift level, on the ordinary people's level, hasn't been very good. We talk about Zhong Gao Mao you know, Chinese uh, Hong Kong disputes or, or, or controversies. And the whole background is about um, uh, you know, a lot of mainland Chinese coming to Hong Kong to buy up products, uh, particularly baby formula and um, all sorts of other, other products because um, there are so many fake products uh, in the market in China. Uh, my relatives from Guang, Guangzhou always come and buy olive oil, you know, all sorts of uh, daily provisions. One thing, and second thing, um, but this was stopped. The baby formula was, thing was solved by an uh, administrative uh, order saying that you cannot leave Hong Kong uh, with more than two baby uh, cans of baby formula. And then there are mainland mothers coming to Hong Kong to, 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 uh, to, to, to give birth to babies and then crowding the hospitals. But again, this was stopped uh, in 2013 with this administrative you know, order stopping you know, coming over. And then um, uh, because of the um, free travel uh, 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 visa that the mainland uh, tourists could get, um, the whole of the uh, Hong Kong retail business changed, uh, which means that it, you can, uh, your ordinary grocery stores now turn into a um, um, uh, jewelry shop catering for uh, Chinese tourists, or um, pharmacy selling baby formula and other products. You know. And then this, this is a sort of um, a kind of uh, daily living that you feel being intruded on. Uh, the land price going up and so on. And then, of course, these young kids, they, grow, they grew up. They were all born after 1997. Um, and then they saw this news on the newspaper about how the mainland government clamped down on the dissidents uh, and then stretching their arm into Hong Kong, uh, the, 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 you know, the, the closing down bookshops and so on and so forth. I won't go into that. So um, there's this uh, distrust, very, very strong distrust uh, between the young, uh, particularly the young generation, uh, Hong Kong and China. And then, so uh, Putonghua, now why do you use Putonghua to, uh, you know, uh, ask us to use Putonghua to teach language? Uh, are you trying to indoctrinate us? So a very set, a, a keen sense of distrust. So Siona, when, when she writes on the newspapers, um, she, would, she would remain on the level of teaching. All right. But then, deep down, she said she's worried about this cultural hegemony uh, or domination. And so you can see this photograph. Uh, the, uh, the, the two groups and the other groups, uh, scholarism, you can see Joshua Wong there. Uh, and then the, also the um, uh, uh, other campus uh, groups uh, join forces to protest uh, against the Education Bureau. Now, don't ask me what about, because they always pick you know, issues on their website, so I have to, uh, I can't tell you right now. So uh, you can see the slogans, uh, don't, uh, don't, what do you call it? Don't contaminate our humanities with red color, communist meaning, right? Uh, I don't want uh, any more uh, international language, uh, national education again, that sort of thing, okay? So it's a culture, uh, this is the ideological domination issue, okay? And then we come, lastly, we come to the identity uh, issue. Um, as I said, uh, um, these young people are very, very much uh, distrustful of the Beijing government. Mm. And this Hong Kong identity has, has, has concretized into um, a kind of feeling that uh, it's they and us, right? It's they and us. You, Putonghua, me, Cantonese. So Cantonese has become the basis of this uh, sense of identity. So uh, Woody said, this is this uh, precocious reading boy, Language is not only a medium of communication. Language is, culture is embedded in Cantonese. Uh, the Cantonese culture is embedded in, uh, in, the, in Cantonese language. Uh, I don't want to see a day when, it, when we have to express ourselves using a language that is not our own, okay? Cantonese disappears from Hong Kong, then we speak in Putonghua, but that's not our language. Then we will lose all our culture. Uh, we can only express very superficial things. Then there will be a cultural abyss, a, a fault, suddenly cut off, right? Alex, uh, this lecturer, this Chinese lecturer, um, he's not only talking about Pu Tonghua, he's also talking about simplified characters, right? Uh, these days when I write him emails or uh, WhatsApp, I have to check my words very carefully, make sure that I don't have simplified characters. <laughs> <laughs> because he doesn't like it at all. Um, the political situation is getting worse these days. I worry that we're not able to use, oh, he's not talking about umbrella, he was talking about post 97. 
uh, I worry that I will not be able to, able to use traditional complex characters and we'll lose our Cantonese language. Then we'll lose our uh, indigenous culture and identify with theirs, you and they, or to undergo cultural affinity with them. Okay, now let me go one step further. Um, right, two more, don't worry. Uh, one step further and, and, and quote from our teacher critic. Now, being a bit older, uh, among the, 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 my interviewees, she was able to see the generation change, the change in uh, just recent, very recent. She said the older generation found that uh, there's my generation and even a generation a bit younger than I am. I'm uh, in the early 60s. You talk about uh, people in the early 40s. Even for that generation uh, who, 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 who are Chinese majors, uh, who are Chinese teachers, uh, they will look up to Putonghua. Or, or in those days, we don't call it Putonghua, we call it Guoyu. Right, national language, Guoyu. It was used in Ken, uh, Taiwan, this, this term. Uh, we, we, at least myself, were, uh, I was looking out into the world in my late, early 20s, and then I thought, um, I like Chinese, I love Chinese, I have to learn Guoyu, uh, Putonghua, uh, in order to reach out to the whole of the Chinese country, its language, its culture. That was in the past, but now the times have changed, and those who are in their early 30s and younger grew up reading this writer, Chan Wan, who, who defended you know, Cantonese because uh, there's an imagined kind of um, um, uh, affinity of Cantonese with, sorry, there's an affinity between Cantonese and an imagined ancient uh, Chinese culture. Maybe imagine is not the right word, but I was borrowing from uh, Anderson. <laughs> Benedict Anderson. Okay, it's a sea change after reclaiming, after 1997. Society and culture are changing, and now people are resistant. And then we come to Alex. Uh, this may be the last slide. Uh, Alex, uh, he has been out in the streets uh, during uh, the umbrella movement. He has been sleeping a lot of nights in Mong Kok and in uh, Admiralty. They were, these were two major occupied areas during the umbrella movement. And then he got really, um, frustrated and sad when the police came and cleared up the place. And he was a bit militant. I mean, he didn't fight, but, but he, he was sort of really angry, you know, with this uh, suppression of the occupation. And then he went back, and then he left the scene, and then he was so dejected after that. So um, he's, he said, I'm, and then after the umbrella, they would talk about Hong Kong independence. I won't go into that because it's so complicated. But he said, I am against Hong Kong independence. I love Hong Kong. I have strongly identified with Hong Kong. I feel very proud when Northern uh, colleagues, he, he, he goes to conferences in China, and then he speaks uh, Putonghua. And then some colleagues would say, hey, you have a very strong Hong Kong accent. And he was so strong, he was so proud of it. Yes, <laughs> I speak Putonghua with a strong Hong Kong accent. But mind you, I'm not a Buntou, I'm, I'm a Buntou Gao, but I am I insist, but I'm not an independentist, right? I'm anti-Hong Kong independence because of my background as a Chinese major, you know. I love, I'm rooted in a Chinese language, in the wider Zhonghua Manfa, a Chinese lang uh, language and Chinese culture. And then his advice to the government is that the more you make these young people learn Chinese through Putonghua, and he teaches a lot of young people because he teaches first year and second year, major, uh, first year and second year um, Chinese language. Um, which they find it unfamiliar, alien, and offensive. Offensive, what's the word? I forgot. Um, 同意嘛, yes, that's what the word is used, Tongyim. The more they react to it, Putonghua is yours, not mine. You force me to identify with what's yours, that's bogus, fake, and very shallow. But, now, the, the, the important thing is the last sentence. If you allow local dialects and regional cultures to survive, though they might differ from the national language, yet they come from the same source. I think he was so well trained in the Chinese language that he understood the relationship between local dialects. Northern dialect is also a local dialect with the whole corpus itself. So it's not, it's not two different cultures. Not, it's not two, I mean, Cantonese and Putonghua, they are not two different, uh, I mean, they're two different dialects, but they are not two different cultures. They all come from the same source. If you want our young people to know and to love China, culture China, then don't force them to learn Chinese in Putonghua uh, because they come from the same source. Um, so they are looking at a broader and a deeper Chinese identity. Uh, this is my yes, last, last slide. But are the, 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 I end with a question. Are the Chinese leaders ready to accept 
acknowledge this broader identity and allegiance? Uh, I don't have an answer right here, but I provide two more bits of information. Number one is uh, from a scholar uh, who wrote an article in 2015. Uh, he was talking about the um, resistance movement in Guangzhou in, in, Guangzhou in 2010. And uh, he said um, uh, on the side of the national government and the provincial government, they tried to toy pu, which is promote Putonghua. Toy pu is not content with verbal communication on a general level. Um, the state officials uh, have a wider goal, bigger you know, goal of elevating so-called cultural level. When you speak Putonghua, you are more civilized. So that is building up a cultural hegemony. So fluent Putonghua symbolizes a higher culture of cultural, uh, a high level of cultural accomplishment. And then sadly, I, I must say, uh, recently I heard of uh, stories about uh, stepped up censorship of the, in the academia. For example, um, I, uh, just a month, less than a month ago, one uh, drama production in Chinese U um, put up by, produced uh, and acted, uh, the actors were from Zhongshan University, from Guangzhou, uh, it was banned. I mean, not, not, not by us, not, not by the Hong Kong government nor the Chinese U uh, 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 authorities, but they couldn't come over the border to, 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 you know, um, have to, to put up this drama show. Uh, it's, on, uh, it's the vagina, uh, vagina monologues. So that's why. <laughs> so, um, so, so that was banned. And I recently heard that a workshop in uh, Zhongshan Daihao in, um, in Guangzhou, at the same, the same university I was talking about, um, a workshop was put on hold. Uh, this workshop was, a historic, was on history, a uh, historical uh, discussion of uh, how to study um, charity organizations in late modern China. And, and this was uh, on hold. I mean, it wasn't banned altogether, but it, it is put on hold. And other stories, I won't go into detail. So um, I'm not sure, you know, with these stories that I heard uh, recently, uh, that the authorities, uh, Hong Kong or the Beijing authorities, have this broad vision, uh, deep vision, of a wider Chinese identity. Uh, so with this note, let me end here, and thank you for your patience.